Ingrid was telling me this morning that uh, Diane's mom is uh, in palliative care, so we can remember Diane and her mom in prayer. This is one of those sections in scripture that I'm not a, a Bible theologian or whatever you want to call it. I am just a simple man that lets God's spirit guide and direct me and, and teach me. And so uh, I'm sure that this is probably going to be one of those subjects that you're probably going to be uh, maybe not on the same page as me. And if you aren't, that's great. And I can always learn, so come and tell me what you think so that we can come together. I don't want anybody leaving here today and saying, well, that's stupid and I'm never going back. So uh, just um, keep that in mind. That's one of the reasons why I always stress study and read the word. Don't take whatever anybody tells you. I don't care who it is. Um, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you go home and you study it. I, I am watching Behold Israel. I like this man because he is, he looks at everything through uh, Jewish eyes. And when he was talking about something similar to this, he wasn't talking about Joel, but he was talking about um, salvation. And he was saying that you have to look first at who God is talking to. So if God's talking to the Jewish people, then you have to keep that in mind. Because it wasn't until Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius and his family got saved and the Holy Spirit was given, that we really started to reach out, or God reached out into the Gentiles. So, the only reason I say that is because once we get Joel chapter 2 done, if we get time, we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, because Peter quoted some of this section that we're going to look at this morning. And did Peter misquote it? No. I think people have misinterpreted what Peter was saying on that day. Anyway, Joel is the first of the prophets. Remember that. He is the first writing prophet. He was in the days of Elijah and Elijah. So he was far ahead of most prophets. Um, and he probably went through a lot of problems because back in those days they didn't just take what a prophet said if you didn't if you didn't have any kind of uh, correctness they stoned you so it's not like that today anyway so Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and if you don't have your bible grab the one from under the seat in front of you uh, I always like people to follow along with me we could put them up on the screen but there's a lot of verses when you get into prophecy there's a lot of verses that you look at. And if you wonder why Gregory didn't play today, I forgot to call him. John's going to have to start reminding me if I forget. <laughs> Some days, this past week, I've had a headache since Sunday until about Thursday, so I'm not sure if it's the pollen in the air or what it is, but anyway, it's much better now. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward. Remember that word. That is the most important word in this section, okay? Afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We're not going to be able to get into the remnant that's going to be protected in Petra. I'm sure we're not going to get that far today, but um, just something to, to think about. So let's ask God to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And Father, we pray that you would bless us and guide us and direct us. And Father, if there is any uh, contentions, which sometimes there is in some of these kind of scriptures, we just pray that we can all come together and, and realize that uh, Jim doesn't know anything, everything, and probably not anything. But anyways, Lord, we just pray that you would bless and help us by your spirit to cut straight your word so that we might be able to uh, give you honor, glory, and praise. Once again, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So that important word was what? Afterward. Okay. Joel is the first prophet to write about this. Now, the other prophets pick it up later on. But Joel starts, and he says, afterward. After what? Does God leave us in darkness? Does God say, okay, I'm going to tell you. Afterward, this is going to happen. But after what? No, he tells us. Look at verse 11 in chapter 2. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? So there's a day coming, and we know that that's at the end of the tribulation period, uh, when if he doesn't come back, then for even the elect will be lost. So then he says in verse 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn you even with, to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. This is looking into the future, but I believe today that this is something that Christians need to do. We are living in a world today where, I don't know, everything's politically correct, right? You know, you, you can do whatever you want, and you can come and sit in the church, and um, they'll just love you and think everything's great. Uh, we need to pour out our heart. We need to be talking to God. We need to be telling him that we're not great, we're not wonderful, and we need his spirit. And that's why I think the poor, uh, when he pours out his spirit, it's so important even to the church today. Verse 13, and you rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and then repenteth him of evil. We looked at these verses, remember, way back about three or four weeks ago? Now Joel is picking up exactly why he told us about these verses. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? So who's going to know if we repent and if we really pour our heart out to God? Who's going to know? God is. Boy, is everybody sleeping already? Follow along with me, okay? God is going to know. You know, I don't know if you remember back in the 70s, but there was a lot of actors and actresses who said, I've been born again. I'm going to heaven. And the next day they're living in sin and terrible things and drugs and all of these things, and yet, oh, I'm born again. You and I look at the outside, but God looks where? He looks at the heart. He looks at the inside, whether we really mean it or not. So then he goes on to the verse 15 to say, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. God usually doesn't tell the children of Israel to have a fast. He usually tells them that they are to bring sacrifices and so on. Here he says, you're going to have a fast. You're going to pour out everything and you're not going to eat or drink for so many days and you're going to be able to pray sincerely. And then he says in verse 15, or verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that, that suck breast, let those that... The bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride of her closet. He want, he's touching everybody, from the smallest child to the oldest person. He wants everybody to repent. You know, we don't always think that children, especially little tiny ones, have to repent. But who taught the baby to cry in the pen when, he, when the baby wants something? <laughs> We don't know, right? That's that old nature that's inside each one of us. When that baby wants something, he just cries and screams and hollers and gets it. And if you've ever been in a store where a seven or eight-year-old is on the floor kicking and screaming because mommy didn't buy him a bubble gum or a chocolate bar or whatever it is, that's that old nature. God knows that we all have it, every one of us, from that tiny baby right up through. So then he says... Let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare the, thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? You know what the nation of Israel did quite often in, in the Old Testament? When they got into trouble and they were being judged, they would say to God, you know what, God, don't do this because all those nations around are looking at it and saying, where's your God? Have you ever had that done to you as a Christian? 
You know, something bad happens and people will say, well, where's your God now? You know, what's he doing now? Is he sleeping? I can remember one time visiting someone in the hospital and when I was going out, their family was coming in and they said, he believes in God. Where's his God? Why is he sick with cancer and so on? I said, his God is right here <laughs> waiting to do whatever God has planned to do for that person. But Israel used that as a, what would you call it? A crowbar to move God, you know? Okay, God, if you don't do something good, all those nations around are going to say, you're not doing anything. You're not doing being what you should be. You're not being our God. Does God play games? No, I'm sorry. God is a holy, righteous, just God. And if he says something, he does it. That's why we looked at it, and we're going to get down to those verses in a minute. He makes promises. He makes promises to you, and he makes promises to me. But he also has, what would you call it, a father's attitude. So when you do something wrong or you're getting off on the wrong direction, he's going to do what? Chasing you, right? He's going to bring you back. My, I think I told you last week, my dad had a strap that he had from a razor, from sharpening a razor. That was his way of bringing us boys back. God does the same thing. He is a loving God that wants to correct his children. Verse 18. Now we're looking at the, Joel's now starting to look at the future. Then will the Lord be jealous of his land and pity his people. If his people will do what we have just read, then God will be jealous or zealous of his land and pity his people. Yes, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied, wherewith I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Is that today? No. Do you know how many missiles were fired on Jerusalem this past week? Over 500. Over 500. Now, some they shoot down, some they don't, don't get to the right spot. Hamas is getting missiles from Iran and Turkey and Syria, and they're, they're shooting them on Israel every day. So are they living in peace? No. They're living in a prosperous time right now, but it's not the time that God is going to tell them about. He says, um, verse 20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and he is ill savor shall come up because he had done great things. All of those people that right now that are shooting those rockets, that are, are trying to drive Israel into the sea, someday God is going to pay them exactly what they are going to get. Nothing less. He's going to pay them exactly. He talks here about the northern army. Why is that the northern army? Because if you go back to chapter 1 in Joel, Joel saw that northern army that was coming. And we looked at um, Ezekiel. 38 and 39, and we saw how God was going to take care of Israel. So then he says in verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. So he's saying to the children of Israel, Don't worry, I am going to fix this. You know, we as Christians sometimes, and I'm trying, to, I'm not, I'm trying not to get off, but sometimes you just got to go with the flow, right? Right? We sometimes as Christians don't realize just how much God is doing every day in our life. We are the, the saddest people. I was talking to a fellow the other day in the bank, and he says to me, I hate this bus driving job because the kids are terrible. And he had this great big frown on his face, and I said, John, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be walking around with your tongue and chin hanging down on the ground, you should be rejoicing. Because God is doing things that maybe you, we don't even see today. They might show up tomorrow or next week. God is always doing things for his people. We are to rejoice. We are to be the gladdest people on the earth. And we are to be looking for a home. Not here, but where? Heaven. Only one or two people speak. Come on, you can answer questions, you can, you can jump up and shout, I don't care. Then it says, um, fear not, O land, and be glad. Rejoice for the Lord great things, but be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do 
bring forth the tree, beareth the fruit, the fruit, the fig tree, and the vine do yield their strength. In, in Romans chapter 8, you know what is groaning right now? Creation. Creation is groaning because uh, it didn't enter into the age of grace like you and I. You want to know why weeds still grow? <laughs> because they're not in the age of grace. They are still living in, in the, the, the curse that God put on Adam and Eve in the garden. So when you get a weed in your garden, don't blame that little flower beside it. It's not his fault. It's still under the curse that Adam and Eve got for falling in sin. So then he says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. We looked at this, and we looked at uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 and 32. This is a promise of blessing. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and 32, it was a promise of spiritual blessing. And we're going to look at that in a minute as well. So then he says, um, I'll, I'll give you the rain that you need for the, the crops to grow. And he emphasizes that in verse 24. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall be overflowing with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. We looked at those, that in chapter 1, and we looked at the fact that it was a gap and it was uh, different types of animal uh, insects that were coming along. I believe that is Revelations, the first part of Revelations where the horsemen go out. And so what's God saying? He's saying, I'm going to restore to you the nation of Israel. Where does most of the tribulation happen? Anybody? Israel. <laughs> when God brings the tribulation, it's, it's a time of trouble or judgment on the nation of Israel. For all the years that they have gone astray, for all the years they have walked in their own past, for all the years that they have not listened and heeded to the Lord. So then he says in verse 27, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Is God in the midst of Israel today? No. Someday he's going to be right in the midst of Israel. Uh, and I am in the midst of Israel that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now we're going to start chasing rabbits, okay? How do we know that God someday is going to be in the midst of the nation of Israel? Zechariah, turn back towards the New Testament just a little ways. Zechariah chapter 14. You have Zechariah, Malachi, and then you got the New Testament. So it's the second to last minor prophet. Chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all the nations against this Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from this city. That is talking about when all the nations shall come. Not just one, not just the northern nation, not just the nations from the west or the east. When all the nations shall come to battle. We know that as the battle of Armageddon, or Megiddo. He says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against these those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. <clears throat> now listen to this. I, I love this because, you know, some people say the Lord's never coming back. <laughs> well, he is coming back. And it says in verse 4, And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now, when, when Zechariah the prophet says that, is he thinking of some spiritual thing? He's actually speaking about a physical coming, standing on the Mount of Olives, then the Lord Jesus Christ. Someday, he's going to restore this earth to the Garden of Eden. But there has to be judgment first because blessings come after judgment. God has got to get rid of sin in this world. Um, does God love sin? No. Can God stand sin? No. So he has to judge sin. And then 
He's going to come, and his feet shall stand in Mount Olives, which be before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great, very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So what's happening? This mountain is going to divide. Not only the mountain, but the nation of Israel, because later on in Zechariah, chapter, I, I think... He talks about the feast days, and if the nations don't come up and worship God at the feast days, he will judge them. And so there's going to be a great river that flows between the Great Sea and the, and the Hinder Sea, and the water is going to come out of the city of Jerusalem. What is that a picture of? Heaven, right? The, the water's coming out of the throne, and it's going to go right by the tree of life. Anyway, so we can't get back into that because we're running out of time. Uh, verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So the day that the Lord comes back, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And if we go into Revelations 20, what's he going to do with Satan and all of his buddies? He's going to cast them in. He's going to chain them up and put them in the bottomless pit, right? And then for a short season later on, he's going to be released. But anyway just for the sake of time today. And then verse 11. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. When the Lord comes back, the nation of Israel will be safe, secure, prosperous, and he will rule with uh, marshmallows. Anybody? Rod of iron. Um. There'll be no more of this nonsense, politically correct and all of that. It'll either be gray or black or white, not gray. It'll be black or white, and if it's black, he's going to punish. Turn with me back to Zephaniah, which is just back towards Joel a little ways, not very far. I think um, the next minor prophet back. Zephaniah chapter 3. And verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all thy heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away all thy judgments. He hath cast all out thy enemies. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. Verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is a mighty he will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, he will rest in his love, and he will joy, with, he will joy over the, thee with singing. Did you know that God sang? The Lord sang? Remember what happened when they had, had the, up, uh, the supper in the upper room? When they left, what did the Lord do? He sang. Isn't that going to be wonderful someday? You know, to hear the Lord sing? I don't know about you, but when I read that verse like that, I think to myself, wow, <laughs> that's going to be amazing. He's going to stand and he's going to sing. And, and poor old Jim is, can't sing, but anyway, he's going to listen to the Lord sing. Okay, back to Joel chapter 2. So there's a day coming when the Lord is going to be king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to rule and he's going to stand on this earth and he's going to be amidst of his people. Now Joel says in verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After what? After the Lord comes back and he's reigning and he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he's, this, this world is, is full of his glory. It says that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Um, I heard one person say that this, it's, just Israel, it's just Jews, but it doesn't say that in my Bible. It says all flesh, so I think everybody's going to get the spirit. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see vision. So you young people, like Bob, will see dreams. As old people, like me, will see visions. I don't know what the difference is, but the young see one thing and the older see something else. So I take that as being a great thing. And also upon thy servants, upon thy handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, old, young, poor, educated, not educated. God is going to pour out his spirit. 
when I read this book, I never open the book without doing one thing first. I pray that God will open the book to me. I, I'm not a graduate of any Bible college or whatever. I went to Moody for some summers, but other than that. So I ask God to put his spirit so that his spirit will guide and direct me. And Joel chapter 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Um, volcanoes would do that. I don't know if it's going to be a vol- bunch of volcanoes or not. There apparently is a ring of fire that goes right around, and it's all volcanoes, even some under the oceans. And if they all went up at once, I guess that's what it would do. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. There is a great and terrible day of the Lord coming. And if we, we could go into uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of these other books, but we're not going to because we're almost out of time. But it's a day of destruction. It's a day of darkness. It's a day of judgment. But and whenever I read a verse like that, I always say, thank you, Lord, because I won't be here. Now, I'm not going to get off and preach the salvation message, but if you know the Lord is your Savior, you're not looking for that day because you won't be here. You will not see the wrath of God. Paul says that in Romans. So I won't be here, and I'm so glad that I won't be, but I'm not going to get on to it. (laughs) But you might have a neighbor or a family member that's lost. They will see that if it happens, and I believe it could happen any time. Second, or Acts chapter 2. Because we want to look at poor old Peter for a minute. And Peter's, Peter is me. He speaks and then he thinks. So um, don't blame Peter for speaking when he maybe shouldn't have spoke so much. But anyway, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What's he saying? Is this the fulfillment of what Joel spoke on? No. He says, but this is that. In other words, this is like what Joel spoke. Now, here's where we might get into some problems. And if you're under the understanding that it's a fulfillment. But the thing is, I, whenever Paul says uh, a prophecy is fulfilled, he says it is fulfilled. When Jesus spoke, he said this is fulfilling that prophecy. Um, in the early ch- chapters of the Gospels, they talked about uh, Rahab crying. Uh, that fulfilled a prophecy about Ramah. So usually when a prophecy is fulfilled, it, they say it's fulfilled. Peter doesn't say that. He says this is like that. What's it, what's it like then? I believe it's like the power uh, when God pours out his spirits after the Lord, Holy Spirit after the Lord comes back, what did we look at in Jeremiah chapter 31? No one will have to be taught. They'll all know from the smallest to the greatest. You won't have to be taught by people like me or anybody else. You'll know, you'll know God, you'll know the Lord, because the Spirit will be upon you. We looked at that last week, if you remember. Anyway, so then Peter says... And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. On the day of Pentecost, did God pour his spirit out on all flesh? No, only 120. And, you know, we've often been taught that they were in the upper room, and they came down in the streets, and the people were all there. I don't believe that. I believe that they were outside the temple. And they began to speak. And the Jewish people began to say, well, these guys are drunk. And Peter goes on to say, well, it's only early morning. Why would we be drinking? We're not drunk. But what you see is what Joel prophesied. So Peter's saying, the power that Joel said God is going to pour out on this earth, we have it. Do you know who else has it? We, <laughs> we do. 
I wouldn't be able to, I would not be able to get up here and, and do anything if it wasn't for God's spirit. You know, um, last night I was reading, and then again this morning I was reading and trying to, you know, when you were like in school, when you had an exam, you crunch notes and you <laughs> do all of these things to get ready. And when I finally thought I was ready, I stood up and I couldn't remember a thing. And when I'm sitting there, and then when John says, you know, come up, all of a sudden, <laughs> and I can't explain it, but all of a sudden, God says, okay, this is what you're going to say. I don't know. It's God's spirit, right, working inside of us? Why did Acts chapter 1 and 2 happen? What was the purpose, I guess? If you look at Acts chapter 1, um, what you will see in verse... Um, Verse 8, I think it is. Yeah, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be, what? Witnesses. Do you know why God pours out his spirit upon us today? So that we can do what? Be witnesses. God is not slack concerning his promises. That's what Peter says, right, in Second Peter? Because he wants what? All to be saved. So he gives you and I his spirit so that you and I can be witnesses. I can remember when I first got saved. I went to work the next day and I said to Bob Solombeer, I got saved last night. God's living inside of me now. And he shook his head and he said, yeah. What did your wife give you for supper? He thought I was having some kind of reaction or something. I said, no, we had the same meals that we always have. He said, well, what's wrong with you? I said, I got saved. I'm born again. He could not believe it. And I, I, when I went to work that morning, I did not think I was going to start telling people about the Lord. I really didn't. So who did it? Me? No. Who did it? Holy Spirit did it. You and I have the Holy Spirit because God wants us to be witnesses. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. We're going to look at that verse for a minute. We're just about out of time. Verse 37. Now when they heard, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So the Holy Spirit was inside of me preaching, and the Holy Spirit was doing what to Bob? Witnessing and convicting. You know, um, you've heard that story about one plants and God waters and brings forth fruit. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit and we go out and we witness and God convicts and he draws and he waters and whatever it takes to bring forth fruit. And so you and I are filled with the Spirit so that we can be witnesses. Okay, so then he says... Uh, in verse 18, and on my servants, on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above. On the day of Pentecost, did the stars fall? Did the moon go? Did the sun go? No. It's not a complete fulfillment of what Joel was saying, but what Peter was saying is, that every one of us now has the spirit inside of us. And I am, how do you word, I'm not a real brave man. Like, but if, if the Lord says something to me and I, I yell it out, like when Jennifer was in the bank and she was at the teller, and I was way back in the line, and I said to her, did you go to Ottawa? And she said, no. I, and the lady beside me says, why would she go to Ottawa? I said she was going to take her kids and show them what uh, communism looked like. Now, I, on my own, I would never have done that. But the Holy Spirit did it, right? The Holy Spirit just took this little tongue, and he started wagging and, and saying what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say. And so you and I have that spirit within us. You and I have the spirit of God. And now, as far as miracles and all of these things are concerned, I'm not sure because I've never done one. 
I've never laid hands on anybody. I tried to with Pearl, but she wouldn't let me, so. <laughs> anyway, it's God give us the spirit, and he gives us power. We need to know that. We need to realize that we have power. And if you don't have power of miracles and all of those things, which I don't have, I've never spoken tongues. Um, I don't know. But I still know I have the power within me, even though I didn't speak in tongues. All we need to do is let God do what? Use us, right? Use us. I am just a vessel. And what I try and do in the morning is I try and pray that I can empty the pride and the, what I think is right and what I think my purpose is and let God fill it with what he wants me to do. So is, is Joel's prophecy completely fulfilled? No. I think it will be fulfilled in the latter days. I heard um, people talking about this great um, bringing in of the harvest I think it's in the tribulation. I think we're, we're going to see harvest every day. But I think it says in Zechariah, I think it's chapter 12, verse 10 maybe, when they look upon him whom they have pierced, the whole nation of Israel will change in one day. But you know what the sad thing is? If you look at chapter 11, two-thirds of the nation of Israel are gone. Only one-third is left. As we look at the world around us today, we're looking at maybe a world that's filled with two-thirds of the people that won't be here when the Lord comes back. Um, we got monkeypox now. Who knows what's coming after that one? We're going to be swinging in trees, biting bananas. We might have anything coming. Who knows? We need to be letting the Spirit use us. That's all I'm trying to say, I guess. You know what? Don't... Don't... Grieve or hinder the spirit, just just let it go. <laughs> if it wants to make you say something or it wants you to do something, then just let it go so that God can use us. John. <laughs>